This is my update for the Russian military operations in Ukraine for April 25th, 2022. And before I get started, I think it's important to every once in a while do a very quick overview on how we got here in the first place. How did this conflict begin? When did it actually begin? We have to think about the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fact that NATO continued expanding afterwards all the way up to Russia's borders. And in addition to that, remember that the US and its partners in NATO, they have waged multiple wars of aggression since then. They have destroyed uh, Russian and previously Soviet allies, countries like Iraq, Libya, and Syria. They were arming and backing and training uh, forces in Georgia, who then in 2008 attacked Russia. And they were doing the exact same thing in Ukraine, creating this national security threat, uh, deliberately so, on Russia's borders. And in addition to that, since 2014, when the U.S overthrew the elected government of Ukraine and installed a client regime. That regime from, from that point onward waged war against the Russian speaking people of the country. Uh, political war and also a literal war in the Donbas region, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Uh, there, there was a minced agreement. There were two of them. Ukraine never fulfilled them and eventually Russia decided to get involved directly. And this was not them starting a war in February 24th, 2022. This was them entering into an ongoing war in a bid to finally bring it to an end. So that brings us here today. And uh, as I've done before, I'm going to take a look at the map, this live uamap.com, this is pro-Ukraine, pro-NATO, pro-US. Just keep that in mind when we take a look at it. Uh, and we can see, again, uh, actually a lot has changed since the last time I did an update. Uh, there are forces assembling, amassing, and fighting all along this line from south all the way to the northeast near Kharkov. Uh, there are talks from the Ukrainian side that uh, Krivoy Rag, Russian forces are assembling to move in that direction. They are assembling and moving north of Mariupol. Mariupol has been completely taken, except for these holdouts hiding underground in the Azovstal steelworks. The rest of the city is completely taken uh, to the extent that the forces involved in that fighting have been uh, redeployed elsewhere in Ukraine. This is even by Western admissions that that is what has happened. And I'll get more into that in a, in a little bit here. And uh, everywhere you see these red rifles, these are offensive actions taken by Russian forces. These flags are territory taken by Russia. And uh, as I've said, this live UA map, they like to... Uh, put anything on here, even if it's just a baseless rumor put out by Ukraine. Uh, and they like to delay depicting territory taken by Russia for as long as possible. Uh, and again, I am going to be looking at several sources here. First will be another briefing by John Kirby, U.S. Department of Defense. This was from April 22nd, 2022. Uh, I'm also going to be taking a look at uh, uh, Ukraine's general staff. I'm going to talk about them a little bit and what they're doing and how they exist as a source of information or misinformation. I'm also going to talk about the Institute for the Study of War. And I will also cite TASS, which is Russian state media. So here's the, tr the transcript. Pentagon Secretary John Kirby holds a press briefing April 22nd, 2022. And uh, the links for all of this will be in the video description below so that you can ch check it out for yourself. Read through the whole thing if you want. There was no video accompanying this transcript. Sometimes there's a video so you could watch it instead of reading it. Uh, John Kirby talks about the Ukraine Consultative Group. It is a non-NATO, uh, Friends of Syria style group. And the reason they're creating this is 
because they have this focus on Ukraine. They want to include countries that are not in NATO, and they also want a group that acts like a front to make it look like NATO is not involved, when in actuality, this entire war is the result of NATO. It's expansion, it's belligerence, and it's stated intention of encircling, containing Russia, and eventually toppling the government in Russia and then incorporating it into the, the EU. Uh, a Europe hole in free, as they say. Uh, and, okay, and then there's these questions that you will you will see asked. He'll open the, the floor to questions, and the Western media will ask questions. So this is a question. It says, I'm going to ask, it is always the same question, but I still don't understand. With all the new weapons that the West has been giving and is going to give soon to the Ukrainians, the tanks, the artillery, everything, do you assess that Ukraine, the Ukraine military is now, has now the capacity to completely push the Russians out of the country, not out of the new zones that they, uh, they and then John Kirby has to cut them off, because this, again, this is what's been going on recently. False optimism that utter war propaganda created, not just for the general public, but also for most of the media. They have actually bought into it, and they honestly believe that Ukraine, up until now, has been winning the war. They honestly believe that Ukraine pushed Russia out from around Kiev when they did no such thing. It was never uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin's objective to take Kiev. That was a fixing operation, and you can tell by the number of troops committed to it. It was uh, between 1 and 1.3 to 1 ratio of Russian attackers to Ukrainian defenders. That is a major city. It's the capital city of Ukraine. There's over 3 million people living there. You would not uh, create a force with that ratio of attackers to defenders if you seriously wanted to encircle and take it. There's just no way. And we know that Russia knows how to take a city because they just took Mariupol and they had a four to one advantage over Ukrainian defenders. So this is what John Kirby says to this person wondering why after sending all of these weapons, Ukraine is, is still not able to push Russia out and Russia is still actually making gains. John Kirby says, that's a question that only the Ukrainian armed forces can answer, not the United States military. What I can tell you is that we, in keeping with another 30 plus nations, are doing everything we can to give them the tools that they need to defend themselves and to push the Russians out. And, and what he's basically saying is we're, we're trying to help the, the Ukrainians. It's up to them to win. We don't know why they're not pushing the, the Russians out yet. And in reality, what's actually happening is uh, the U.S. is fully aware that Ukraine isn't going to win. They're just trying to prolong this conflict for as long as possible to bleed out the Russians and fight them to the very last Ukrainian, if possible. Uh, another question was about small arms ammunition. Uh, these are you know bullets that you need to put into your AK. Uh, assault rifle and other small arms, machine guns, handguns, things like this. And John Kirby, has, he has talked about this before, and this is what he says. He says, uh, small arms ammunition is the lifeblood here for the Ukrainian armed forces. We don't talk a lot about small arms ammunition. It doesn't get the headlines. I understand that. But in every discussion we have with the Ukrainians, they talk about how important that is. And to date, the United States has helped coordinate and deliver more than 50 million rounds of small arms ammunition to Ukraine just since the invasion. And not all of that is U.S. caliber because uh, Ukraine has small arms that do not take uh, U.S. standard rounds. So they have to source that from a country that makes ammunition for Soviet and Russian style weapons. 50 million rounds sounds like an awful lot of bullets, doesn't it? But, but actually it isn't. And uh, let me explain to you why it isn't. Check out this independent institute, uh, independent.org. This is from 2007. If you miss the first time, try firing another 300,000 rounds. And they're talking about a study done that figures between the combined conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, US soldiers would have to fire 250,000 rounds to kill just one enemy combatant. 250,000 rounds. They were trying to source so many 
uh, small arms rounds that they ended up having to ask other countries because they were they were running out. They were firing bullets as fast as they could make them. Uh, it says right here, 1.2 billion cartridges fell short of the government's demand. Uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, right up here it says, between fiscal years 2000 and 2005, total requirements per year for small caliber ammunitions more than doubled from about 730 million to nearly 1.8 billion rounds, while total requirements for medium caliber ammunitions increased from 11.7 million rounds to almost 22 million rounds. And this was the US fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. And if the same formula can be used for the fighting in Ukraine, 250,000 rounds per kill, and then uh, for 50 million rounds, that's like 200 kills. That would equate to 200 kills. Ukraine being able to kill 200 Russians for 50 million rounds. If that, if that formula works out, uh, of course, the fighting in Iraq and in Afghanistan and in Ukraine, these are, these are different situations. Afghanistan and Iraq were different than each other. And even the type of combat varied. Uh, inside each country and between different points of those conflicts. But let's just say that it does, that the number is somewhere around there. And it's not hard to imagine. I mean, look, look at a firefight on a modern battlefield and look at what soldiers do. They are firing a lot of rounds. They're not even aiming most of the time. They are laying down suppressive fire so that other units can maneuver into place. Uh, they're trying to keep the enemy's head down, pin them in a certain location so that they can call in artillery or mortars or an airstrike. And that is how modern combat is fought. It is not one shot, one kill. That is why you have snipers, because uh, the average combat soldier is not going to be uh, very accurate in their firing. It is a t t two totally different types of marksmanship. And if, if you've never experienced it, it's hard to explain, but when you're at the rifle range and you're just in your, your uniform and you're able to get into all of the firing positions and you're in a relatively stable environment, it's a lot easier to hit that target. When you're loaded up in combat gear, even just during combat training, it's a lot harder to hit those targets. It is. 50 million rounds isn't gonna cut it. It's not gonna cut it. It's not enough. And we've seen stories in the Western media. Uh, this one from Wall Street Journal. US asks allies to provide ammunition to Ukraine to avoid stock shortage. And they're, they're trying to ask everyone to please send ammunition because there just simply isn't enough and they're running out of it. There's this one from the Daily Beast. They want to fight for Ukraine, they just need guns. And they talk about all of these weapons that uh, Ukraine's government handed out. Uh, 25,000 automatic rifles and 10 million rounds. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But it's actually only 400 rounds per rifle. And to put 400 rounds into perspective, if you've ever seen a soldier or a Marine loaded out and they've got those magazines uh, in their webbing, they could be like six or seven magazines. So you've got something like 200 something rounds. And so 400 rounds would be two loadouts. And uh, that's not a lot. That's, that's not enough for a firefight. That's just enough to get the enemy's attention just in time to run out of ammunition. That's what that is. And so you're seeing all of these numbers and the, the Western media is acting as if the West is really helping Ukraine and they've got this chance of stopping Russia. But again, war is all about logistics. Russia has several major uh, ammunition plants churning out millions and millions of rounds, uh, probably well over a billion every single year. And they have the ability to get that to the battlefields along short and relatively safe logistical lines. Ukraine, on the other hand, now has to import all of it and then get it from the West all the way to the front line. They've got to make sure it's safe from cruise missiles hitting warehouses where it's getting staged. And then they have to actually get it to the front line uh, so that they can use these rounds. So these are, these are little details that the Western media doesn't go into. They don't want to talk about it. The Pentagon, they're admitting how serious this is, how important small arms ammunition is. And if they don't have it, uh, they're not 
they're not going to be able to continue fighting the war. We've, we've heard stories of these mercenaries or these volunteers going to Ukraine and get, getting only 10 bullets. That is because there is a serious shortage. And when you hear 50 million rounds, that sounds like a lot, but it's not anywhere near enough for what they're trying to do. The media also asked uh, Kirby about Afghanistan and those who worked with America, you know, what about them, what's going on? And John Kirby gave this very generic answer. And even though this has nothing to do with Ukraine directly, it is an illustration of how the U.S. uses nations, uses political groups, and then disposes them and forgets about them as soon as they're done using them. They did it to Afghanistan, and they're doing it right now to Ukraine. And if the administration in Taiwan does not wake up, they're going to do it to them tomorrow. Uh, and that was about it for the Pentagon brief. I want to get into this Institute for the Study of War, ISW. Let's take a look. This is one of their assessments. This was from April 23rd, 2022. The Institute for the study of war who who is behind this it's frederick kagan Th these are the people who signed off on this report that i'm about to go over it's frederick kagan uh, who worked for uh, general stanley mccrystal and general david petraeus and john allen in afghanistan a military blunder 20 years of basically pilfering trillions of dollars from the American taxpayers, uh, killing civilians, wrecking a country, and then leaving it in ruins. That's what Afghanistan was. And so Frederick Kagan's one of the experts who advised America's military leaders regarding that entire fiasco. So he's, he's got a very checkered track record. Uh, and, and he's also the brother of Robert Kagan, who's married to Victoria Nuland, who was directly involved in the 2014 U.S.-sponsored coup in Ukraine that got this whole war started in the first place. A lot of what Fred Kagan did was uh, create consensus and war propaganda regarding Afghanistan. We saw how that ended. And so now he and his team at ISW, they're doing the exact same thing for Ukraine. So when I, I go through this, I think it'll be very clear. There's also Karolina Hurd. Uh, she's a Russia researcher. Her entire background is academia. And she's, pro, she, you know, she's obviously part of this pro-NATO, pro-military industrial complex establishment. She has no practical experience regarding combat, war, fighting a war in any way. There's also Katarina Stepanenko, and uh, she's a R Russia researcher on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War. She's from Kiev, uh, and she also went to, they all went to George Washington University. So there's a, there's a lot of nepotism going on here. This is, this is a politically motivated organization. This is not a, a truly analytical organization giving serious analysis. It is one of these mills churning out talking points for the Western media to repeat. This is part of shaping consensus and also shaping war propaganda. I'm going to show you exactly how they did that. And we're going to go through some of the points they made in this assessment. Again, this whole thing is going to be in the video description below. If you want to read through it and take a look at all of the maps, you can go ahead and do that. So, so one of the claims in this assessment is that Russian forces continued offensive operations along multiple axes, even as they completed moving reinforcements drawn from the retreat from Kiev into the east and continued redeploying some forces from Mariupol to the north. The Russians have not taken time to refit troops moving from Kiev or Mariupol before recommitting them to combat operations. And this assumes uh, and this is what they had claimed themselves before, that Russia is taking these hor horrendous losses. They're losing so many men and machines. It's a complete disaster. And they fled for their lives from Kiev. Uh, that, that was part of what they were saying when that was all going on. And now these same units are showing up in Donbass. Uh, from 
around Kiev and also from Mariupol because the fighting there is very much over. And they're showing up in Donbass and they're saying, oh, they didn't take any time to refit or, or regenerate these forces. Uh, how is that possible? It's possible if they didn't suffer the sort of losses that uh, propagandists have been claiming since this war began. NATO has claimed that Russia lost somewhere between 7,000 and 15,000 troops. And the disparity between 7,000 and 15,000, which is more than double, uh, it just goes to show you how they have no real facts. I mean, you, you cannot have information coming in and, and then have such a wide disparity in casualties. Uh, but if that were true, they would not be able to do that. If these units were so badly mauled, in fighting around Kiev, they would not be able to just send them to the Donbas to begin fighting with, with minimum time taken to re-equip them and reinforce them. I've talked about Michael Kaufman. He's, uh, he's another one of these pro-Western military experts. Uh, and he does a podcast almost weekly uh, on War on the Rocks with Ryan Evans. And he said, to his credit, he said, look, in, if in a couple of weeks, and this was a couple of weeks ago, if Russia is still carrying out military operations and their fighting capacity hasn't collapsed yet, uh, then we, we need to reassess some of these claims made about Russian losses. We might not be getting the right information. We might have to revisit where we're getting that information from. Where do you think uh, the Institute for the Study of War is getting all of their information from? Uh, let's take a look. If you notice, they, they have footnotes here. So let's go down to the footnotes. All the way down here. <laughs> Facebook. Who, who's Facebook? The general staff of Ukraine's Facebook. Uh, it's actually this one right here. This is where they're getting almost all of their information. Uh, 15 out of 44 sources are from Ukraine general staff. And... Uh, you know, what you're going to get from Ukraine's general staff is like this. This was five hours ago. This is a video from weeks ago. Okay, so it's just absolute war propaganda. That's what Ukraine's general staff is putting out. And they, they have to. It's, they're responsible for the protection of Ukraine. They cannot protect Ukraine. They are partly responsible for this conflict beginning in the first place alongside the Ukrainian government and, of course, NATO and the United States especially. And so they're going to try to uh, shirk responsibility for this and, and just pretend that they're winning. What else does this ISW assessment claim? It claims Russian forces from around Mariupol are re redeploying to the vicinity of Donetsk city and are likely to enter combat again soon without rest or refit. That is possible if you are not taking the losses that the West is claiming, or it's possible if Russia is so low on troops they can't afford to give them rest or refit them, which we know is not true because the amount of forces in Ukraine does not represent the total number of forces Russia has at its disposal. It also claims that Russian forces are attempting to forcibly mobilize residents of temporarily occupied settlements in Kherson and Zaporozhia, despite growing resistance movements. <laughs> so uh, again, who is their source? Their source is Ukrainian general staff. Ukrainian general staff said, and how would they know that? They wouldn't know that. And pressing people into service and sending them off to fight is a terrible strategy. And Russia would not be making the gains that they are if they were taking random people off the street, giving them a Kalashnikov and sending them into battle. Again, this is not GI Joe. This is real combat. And when you have a soldier, they need to be trained properly. That takes months to do. And so this, this talk about forcibly mobilizing residents is just pure war propaganda. They also claim Russian forces allegedly organized buses for civilian evacuation from Mariupol, but canceled the evacuation on the grounds that Ukrainian nationalists were planning on attacking the civilians. And then it says, such actions that spoil the evacuation process likely represent further attempts to shape the information space in Mariupol and globally, as well as extend administrative control in captured portions of the city. The entire city is captured. The entire city is captured, which goes to show you the, the quality of their so-called analysis. I want to point your attention to this Washington Post article. Again, I've gone over this many times. Uh, Russia has killed civilians in Ukraine. Kiev's defense tactics add to the danger. 
and uh, I've read this many times, I'm going to read it again. The Ukrainian military has a responsibility under international law to remove their forces and equipment from civilian populated areas like Mariupol. And if that is not possible, to move civilians out of those areas. If they don't do that, that is a violation of the laws of war because what they are doing is they are putting civilians at risk because all that military equipment are legitimate targets. And that was an entire Washington Post article about how Ukraine refuses to evacuate cities and how they are putting all of their military equipment into heavily populated areas, using them as human shields, essentially. So the ISW assessment claiming that it's Russia who's not evacuating the these, these civilians, not allowing them to evacuate, and is just staging these attempts to try to evacuate them, to make the Azov Nazis held up in Azovstal steelworks look bad, as if they needed any help at all to do that. It just goes to show you that it's not Russia trying to shape uh, the information space in Mariupol and globally, it's ISW. That's their whole job. That's what uh, Fred Kagan was doing in Afghanistan. That's what he and his team are doing regarding Ukraine. Speaking of Mariupol, uh, let's look at TASS, Russian news agency. So keep it in mind, it's uh, this is Russian state media. Uh, Russia to open humanitarian corridor from Av Azovstal from 2 p.m., Defense Ministry. Uh, they're once again declaring a humanitarian corridor from Azovstal, which uh, has been open, operating around the clock for 36 days for the evacuation of civilians, workers, women, and children who are trapped at the facility. And this is because uh, this is because the militants trapped inside these Azov Nazis they claim that there's all of, all of these civilians in there. And there may or may not be, but it was their responsibility to evacuate them from Mariupol before fighting even began, and they didn't. Then it was their responsibility to move their military equipment out of heavily populated areas, and they didn't. They're only at, as of stall, in the first place, an industrial facility because Russia left them nowhere else to hide. And now they're there attempting to save their skins by claiming that there's civilians trapped in there with them. And Russia is giving them the benefit of the doubt and opening this humanitarian corridor for these civilians to be let out. And there's absolutely no reason at all why Russia would not want those civilians let out at this point. Russian President Vladimir Putin had canceled the actual storming of the facility, but there has been no attempt to stop rocket attacks, shelling, and bombing of the facility. And as I've said in previous updates, they will continue probing the outer perimeter of this facility to take buildings and structures to make sure that those are permanently secured and that the militants have a smaller and smaller area to hide. So that that's ISW. I, I think that's all there is to say about ISW. And, and ISW are the type of people who are filling the Western media with these fantasies that have them asking such ridiculous questions at Pentagon briefings like the one that I just talked about with John Kirby on April 22nd. Now, Bucha, this is a, a northwestern suburb of Kiev. This is where the so-called Bucha massacre happened. The Western media from, from the beginning claimed that Russian soldiers were going around executing locals before leaving the area. Uh, and then people were looking at the dead bodies and they said that that looks relatively fresh these these deaths look very fresh it looks like they happened after russia withdrew and then the new york times showed a satellite image or a series of satellite images that showed uh, dead people everywhere at dates that were supposedly during the russian occupation of that territory and i said that there were two groups of people who died there were the people who died in the fighting between Russian and Ukrainian forces. Ukraine shelled Russian positions the entire time they were in Bucha. And I've showed the footage that Ukraine itself made available of them shelling these residential areas uh, to target Russian military forces. I said uh, the, there will be people who clearly died from artillery and there will be people more recently killed when Ukrainian forces, these extremist factions when they went in there to carry out punitive operations against people they claim were collaborators. So here's The Guardian finally admitting that yes, most of these people were killed by artillery. And look at how, look at how they present this argument. Dozens of Bucha civilians were killed by metal darts 
from Russian artillery. Forensic doctors discover flèches rarely used in modern warfare in bodies found in mass graves. Well, I don't know how rare it is that flèche rounds are used, but I know that they've been used uh, in Ukraine since 2014. And I know that because there's this AFP article Right here, surgeons in Ukraine's rebel Donetsk confirm cluster bomb usage. And look at that little dart, and look at this one right here. That is the exact same type of dart. That is the exact same type of round used in Donetsk in 2014 by Ukraine on their own people in the Donbas region. And then, obviously, it was them shelling Russian positions with these same rounds. They're claiming... Look at this more recent Guardian article. They're claiming that it was from Russian artillery. And they're saying it's uh, tiny metal arrows from shells of a type fired by Russian artillery, forensic doctors have said. And of course, these are Ukrainian forensic doctors. It was a Ukrainian investigation, and they had some help from their European allies who are helping arm them to fight the Russians. So there was no impartial objective investigation. That was deliberately blocked uh, by the UK during a UN Security Council meeting. So the, the Guardian is claiming that Russia fires these rounds. And uh, I, I'm showing you this AFP article from 2014. A pro-Russian separatist fighter shows a dart from a flèche shell uh, on October 21st, 2014 in Donetsk, Ukraine. Surgeons in East Ukraine's rebel hub of Donetsk where dozens of civilians have died in recent weeks, confirmed on Tuesday that some patients were victims of cluster bombs as alleged by Human Rights Watch. Then they talk about these little darts that they showed the picture of and the same ones they said were used in Bucha. The little darts cause grave injuries. There have been cases when we found up to 20 or 30 of them in one person. And of course, uh, cluster munitions were banned uh, a lot of countries signed that treaty, but not Ukraine, nor nor did U.S. or Russia. So this most recent Guardian article is lying. Maybe Russia is using them, but Ukraine for sure has been using them and using them on their own people since 2014. That area was being held by Russians. So how were Russians shelling the positions that they were holding? That's not how artillery works. It's It's used for hitting targets thousands of meters away. And so it was almost certainly the Ukrainians shelling those positions. And I have not seen any evidence to suggest that the Ukrainians were shelling Bucha specifically to kill civilians, but they were most definitely shelling Bucha. They have videos of this that they themselves have published. I just thought I'd give an update on the situation in Bucha. I mean, it was very obvious what happened. And this evidence makes it even more obvious that it was Ukraine that killed those people. And yet the Western media is, is not only going to continue to blame Russia, but it's a story that doesn't even make sense. How was Russia shelling their own position? It makes no sense. And, I, and I've done a whole video dedicated just to this, this recent development regarding Bucha. It's very short. It's very easy to share versus this much longer uh, all-inclusive update regarding this, the situation in Ukraine. Now, finally, the last item that I want to talk about is uh, this story. This is from ABC Australia. Ukraine disappointed as Austria says besieged nation shouldn't be offered EU membership. And, and there's why is this a surprise to anyone? They're clearly using Ukraine. And when they're done, they're going to pull in Afghanistan. They're just going to leave them there in absolute ruins. They don't care what happens to Ukraine. And this is a wake up call to all of these other nations around the globe or these opposition groups in nations around the globe that think the West is their friend. If they will do this to Ukraine, a nation where the people sort of look like Western Europeans and Americans, then they are definitely going to do this to nations, say here in ASEAN in Southeast Asia, where I'm based. The article is talking about Austrian Foreign Minister Alexander Schallenberg, and uh, he calls for a different way for Ukraine to connect with Europe. And he justified his position by saying there were countries in the Western Balkans uh, who the EU calls enlargement countries who have come a long way without full membership. So again, they want to use Ukraine. They, there is no place at the table for Ukraine or the current leadership. They're being used. They had no intention of ever giving Ukraine a place at the table. That was never going to happen. They were always a proxy. 
Uh, a lot of people said, you know, Ukraine was never going to be a, a NATO member. What is Russia so upset about it? A non-NATO member that is being de facto NATOized and militarized right on Russia's border is more dangerous because it can be part of a massive proxy war without the rest of NATO ever having to intervene directly. And, and again, fighting the Russians to the last Ukrainian and then giving someone else the tab. They don't want to pick up the tab and rebuild Ukraine. That That's what's happening. That's what's going to happen. This is what the US and the EU does everywhere. Look at Libya, still a smoldering failed state. All of these promises that the US and the EU made the, the opposition leaders in Libya in 2011, and all of those promises broken, and the fate of Libya today will be the fate of Ukraine tomorrow. And if the, uh, again, the administration in Taiwan is not smarter, it'll be them further down the road. So that does it for this update on the conflict in Ukraine, Russian military operations unfolding in Ukraine. So if you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please check the video description for other places you can find my work like on Odyssey or on Rumble. I'm also on Telegram and I've noticed that you can uh, it seems like you can upload full-length videos on Telegram. So if you're following me on Telegram and I get deleted off of every other platform, you can still find and follow my work there on Telegram. In the video description below, like I said, all of the links to everything that I just talked about is going to be there. It's a huge amount of information. Anything that you're interested in, feel free to dig into it. Also in the video description below are ways you can help support my work. You can do that through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and through PayPal. To everyone who has been uh, contributing, whether it's month to month or through one-time donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, sending me kind words or news tips, that's all greatly appreciated. I could not do this work without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.